Marvel's destruction of their multiverse was the greatest comic book story that was ever told in the history of comic books because it has everything. You have Thanos who's hopping across the multiverse, killing all the superheroes across multiple worlds. You've got the cosmic entities getting obliterated. Captain America gets the Infinity Gauntlet and then it promptly gets destroyed. It's phenomenal. It's incredible. Incredible. And it all kicks off with what's called the Incursions and Avengers World. I will have a reading order down in the description, by the way, if you decide to go through and collect the comics and read them yourself. But in Incursions and Avengers World, it starts when Black Panther learns about the Incursions. And he learns about this by way of a woman named Black Swan, in the sense that he sees a rhinoceros running out of what appears to be an invisible wall. When he crosses that barrier, he basically sees another Earth orbiting the Marvel Earth as if it were like a moon. And then these people appear, along with with this woman with white hair. Her name is Black Swan. She becomes incredibly important from that point going forward into the story. But she basically ends up detonating what is in effect an antimatter bomb that was left on that Earth out there in space, and it blows the Earth apart. And so Black Panther ends up defeating her alongside some of her henchmen, and then he basically takes her prisoner. At that point, he calls in the Illuminati. But the Illuminati, historically speaking in Marvel, a lot of you guys know this, but for those of you who don't, they were just kind of like a coming together of the heads of the superhero communities, or the most prominent superhero teams in Marvel. They would share information, different things like that, but they were very secretive, kind of controlling the world behind the scenes to a degree. But at this point in time, Professor Xavier of the X-Men was dead. He had been killed since Avengers vs. X-Men, which is actually a story that we'll reference later on in this video. And Captain America had taken his place. And so when the Illuminati are brought together, Black Panther explains everything he saw. And then Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four goes to basically interview or talk to Black Swan. And the way that she explains it, what Black Panther saw was an incursion. And and what she did is she prevented the destruction of their Earth. And that the way this works, which you may or may not know about during your travels from Doctor Strange 2 and whatnot, is that an incursion is when another Earth appears in the sky of a Earth. And from the time that second Earth appears, you have eight hours to either destroy it or be destroyed. Because what happens is that if both those Earths collide with each other, both universes are completely and totally wiped out. But if you destroy one of the Earths, then the universes pass right through each other. And what's cool here is Black Swan explains some of the strategies that other realities have used to save themselves from the multiversal collapse. For instance, some superheroes on other Earths have actually evacuated as many people as they could from their planet and then destroyed their Earth. It's considered a cowardly thing, but some have done it and it preserved their universe anyway. Other times, superheroes just fought the good fight and they ultimately perished and there was nothing they could do. But once all this is explained to Reed Richards, he basically explains it to the rest of the Illuminati. And the question they have have is like, what do we do here? And the real solution is we use the Infinity Gauntlet because the Infinity Gauntlet's so incredibly powerful, you can do anything with it. And so they assemble the gauntlet. It's given to Captain America because he's like the only guy who won't be corrupted by its power. And then Captain America successfully pushes the other universe away when a second incursion happens. The problem is that in the process, the Infinity Stones are destroyed, except for the Time Stone, which disappears. It does eventually come back later on. We may or may not talk about it in this video because it's not overly important, but it is kind of cool. It deals with Kane the Conqueror and all that kind of stuff. But the important thing is that because the Infinity Gauntlet could not stop the incursions, it was like writer Jonathan Hickman telling us right off the bat, the multiverse is going to end. The most powerful object in the universe could not stop an incursion. It's only a matter of time before the superheroes and all of the universe and even the multiverse gets completely wiped out. And so in this first part with incursions and Avengers World, all the incursion stuff is covered in new Avengers. Avengers World is just the Avengers comics. They're not overly important, but they're kind of important at the same time because they introduce some plot threads. But the idea here is that at some point, Iron Man went to Captain America and said, like, the Avengers are basically just a team based out of New York. We need to think bigger. And so Avengers World is basically the formation or the coming together of all these different superheroes across the world that are brought in under the mantle of Avengers. You do get the introduction of guys like Ex Nihilo and Abyss and things like that. Their whole thing doesn't really get explained super well until until you get to Infinity, which is what we'll talk about right now. So Infinity was the second part of this whole multiversal collapse. And this introduced something called the Builders, that Marvel has had various origins for the universe and even the multiverse over their entire publication history. There's been times where they said the Celestials created everything. There's been times where they said, well, you know, the universe was just birthed into existence from a big bang and it wasn't really created by anybody in particular. The way that Jonathan Hickman explained it in Infinity is the Builders were just this really, really old race that by whatever manner and whatever means, the universe came into existence. But it didn't have any life in it. It was just a series of planets and gas 
rocks as stars and all that kind of stuff. What the builders did is they basically created life on varying worlds. And they did that through a combination of like Alephs, which were basically just really advanced robots, Ex Nihilos, who were considered gardeners, and the Abyssi, if you want to call it that. Basically the chick that has really dark hair. And the way this would work is that Ex Nihilo would create life on these worlds. And if the builders weren't satisfied with it, Abyss would wipe them out and then Ex Nihilo would start all over again. And so it was a really, really cool concept because during the Infinity event, what ended up happening is the builders made their presence known. And they were traveling across the universe and looking at all these different worlds that they considered to be mistakes. And they were just raising them, right? Just wiping out entire worlds. That the Alephs were basically like the world destruction force. These robots would descend onto a planet. They would wipe out all life on that planet and then move on to the next as part of the builder fleet. And so again, because you basically have the story split between new Avengers and Avengers, the Avengers portion of Infinity focuses on two things. The first is that it focuses on the builder war, which is to say the Avengers going to war alongside the rest of the universe against the builders. I mean, it's like the Avengers and the Kree and the Scroll and the Badoon, like the Shi'ar Empire, the whole nine yards. It's the universe fighting for its life against this overwhelming force. There's this really, really amazing moment in the story where there's a kind of parlay that's struck between the forces of the universe and the builders. And Captain America is kind of like leading this force, right? Like just this unified front of all these empires across the universe. And the kind of parlay is orchestrated by Captain America with Thor speaking on his behalf. You guys who have read the story know exactly what I'm talking about. So Thor shows up here to talk to the builder. And what ends up happening is Thor just kind of like says a prayer to his hammer, right? He was like, you know, father, if you ever found me worthy, guide my heart and not just my hand. And so what he does is he throws the hammer into the sky. And then the conversation between him and the builder starts. And the whole time this conversation's going on, the hammer flies out into, into space. It goes into a star and loops back. And so on its way back, while the builder's talking all this trash to Thor, one of the guys who's on this ship with Captain America, it's just like, there's something, like there's something coming into orbit. And Gladiator, who's the leader of the Shi'ar Empire, one of the races working alongside Captain America, he's like, what is it? And Captain America's like, a reckoning. And so like, this hammer is just descending back down to the planet at just incredible speed. And while the builder's talking trash to Thor, he's telling him like, your race is subservient, right? The human race is a plague, all that kind of stuff. We mean to end that plague and so on and so forth. And so Thor's like, what if I am not not just a man. And like the hammer comes flying down and punches a hole through this builder, right? And then Captain America's like, they can be broken so they can be beaten. And then Thor like rallies all these different forces across the universe together with this resounding speech about how there's battle to be fought here and all that kind of stuff. It was really, really, really cool. Now, eventually the Avengers and the forces of the universe go on to defeat the builders. But before that defeat comes, the new Avengers comics, which focus on the Illuminati, have the Illuminati meeting with one of the builders. And what the builder reveals is that while they are traveling across the universe and raising all these different worlds, their main target is Earth. And their main target is the destruction of the Earth. Because if they obliterate Earth, then it saves the universe. Now, of course, following the defeat of the builders, they're no longer a credible threat. And so the story transitions to the second part, which is Thanos. And the reason why is because over the course of Infinity, with the Avengers out in space fighting the Builder War and the Illuminati out doing their thing, Earth was largely just unprotected because the X-Men were fractured during the events of like schism and all that kind of stuff. So there's no one there to really keep it safe. Thanos had actually been traveling across the universe, killing all his offspring for fear of the fact that they would rise up against him and destroy him one day. And he ends up learning that he has a child on Earth. And so over the course of Infinity as kind of a background part of the story. Thanos was on Earth, wiping out the Inhumans for the most part and trying to find his son. Eventually he does. But once you get to the end of Infinity, it all comes to a head. The Avengers and their guys face off against Thanos and his Black Order, so like Corvus Glaive, Proxima Midnight, Ebony Maw, Black Dwarf, Supergiant, those guys. And ultimately, Thanos is not killed and his Black Order isn't killed. Instead, they're imprisoned in Amber. And what that does is it allows Jonathan Hickman to put them on the back burner because he brings them back later on in the story. But after Infinity, and one of the things that I do want to point out here is that even during the incursions in Avengers World storyline, as well as Infinity, Jonathan Hickman was doing small things here and there, basically bolstering and growing the super 
superhero community and the number of superheroes that would be a part of this multiversal collapse. So you saw, for example, the introduction of Starbrand through the last white event, as well as Nightmask. Nightmask was a little weird because seemingly he didn't feel overly important to what was going on, but he did kind of have a role to play. Starbrand was a really cool and really powerful superhero, that his power was relative to whoever he was fighting, and he couldn't control his level of power. So he was similar to the Hulk in the sense that where the Hulk gets stronger, the angrier he gets. Whenever Starbrand faces off against a foe, he has just enough power to defeat that foe, and it doesn't matter who it is. You also saw like the introduction of a new version of Hyperion whose origin story was effectively that of Superman, sent from a dying world and all that kind of cool stuff. It was interesting. But after Infinity, you go into the post-Infinity landscape and original sin, and this is really where the story starts to pick up. Because one of the things that happens here is as part of the post-Infinity landscape, Jonathan Hickman introduces what's called the bridge. And the bridge was constructed by Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four prior to the multiversal collapse, but it basically just not been used. It had been dismantled for a period of time. But the bridge is restored and it allows the Illuminati to look into other universes and see how other realities are faring with regards to the incursions. But then you also get an introduction of a new group called the Black Priests. And the Black Priests are really, really cool here because they're just kind of like this massive enigmatic force that travels the multiverse and is astronomically powerful and they use magic. But what makes the Black Priest so cool is like this. So if I sit down and I say the word magic, right? I say that whole word. With the Black Priest, it doesn't work that way. One person says M, one person says A, one person says G, so on and so forth. And so each member of the Black Priest possesses one letter of their alphabet. So depending on the length of the word and the spell they're casting, it might take two members of the Black Priest, or it might take all of them working in unison. But whenever they show up to a world, they annihilate all the superheroes and destroy the planet. But the Black Priest, we'll talk about them here in a minute because they, they become very important once you get to Time Runs Out. What's also cool about the idea of the bridge is you actually end up seeing different versions of the Illuminati. That it's not always Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four and Black Panther and Namor and those guys. Sometimes it's also like Magneto or Dr. Doom or something along those lines. So it's really cool the way the whole thing plays out. But as a bigger part of all of this, Original Sin is what blew the top off of it all. And it's what really sets the stage for Time Runs Out. Because Original Sin was a story that Marvel wrote where basically the Watcher died. And when the Watcher was killed, everything that the Watcher had seen in relation to any one particular character was revealed to that character. So one of the things that we didn't talk about, and I wanted to wait until this moment to bring it up, is that when Black Panther in the Illuminati, including Captain America, first learned about the incursions, that when the Infinity Gauntlet failed, the question was, what do we do next? And the answer from everybody in the Illuminati, except for Captain America, is we create antimatter bombs and we blow up these alternate Earths. But Captain America was like, no, 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 no. We don't kill innocent people like that. It's not their fault any more than it's our fault. And we're not going to descend into just that level of violence and chaos. It doesn't matter. And so what ended up happening is under the direction or at least at the direction of Tony Stark, Doctor Strange wiped the mind of Captain America of all knowledge of the Illuminati and everything that they had done and were going to do. Original Sin restores it all. And so Captain America not only realizes that the Illuminati exist, he realizes what they intend to do. And so that sets the stage for his character. Now, most of Original Sin in relation to Captain America actually deals with the return of the Time Stone following its disappearance when they first tried to stop the incursions. It's not overly important, but it is kind of cool because Captain America is basically sent forward through time to different points. But in the far flung future, he's brought to like Kang the Conqueror, Immortus, Iron Lad, who are all basically the same person, but at different points in their lives, right? Like yourself as a teenager, then yourself in your 30s, and then yourself in your 50s, all together in the same place. And what they do is they try to imprison him because what they realize is Captain America is going to go back and he's going to try to stop the Illuminati. But the Illuminati are doing the right thing. The destruction of alternate Earths is the only thing you can do. And so as a result of that, Captain America ultimately escapes and that sets the stage for Time Runs Out. Now this part, right, Time Runs Out is the conclusion of the collapse of the multiverse. And it actually does an eight month time skip. The reason why Marvel did this is because it allowed Marvel to wrap up pretty much all the solo series for all the different superheroes who are part of the Avengers and New Avengers cast. A really good example of this is Captain America because what you guys will notice if you go through and you read through the collapse of the multiverse, then you get to time runs out 
is that suddenly Captain America is this really old guy. The reason why that happened was because in the Captain America solo series, he faced off against a villain called the Nail who took away his super soldier serum. And so Captain America just ages up incredibly fast. But because of the nature of this time skip, Time Runs Out basically picks up with the fact that like Captain America is now the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and using the entirety of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s forces, he's hunting the Illuminati, trying to find them everywhere he can. And so for the Illuminati themselves, this is a very difficult situation to be in because on one hand, they're trying to stop the incursions, but on the other hand, they're trying to avoid Captain America and his forces. And so one of the cool things here is kind of a, as a, as far as the publishing side goes, that what you end up having is this situation where instead of it being like Avengers issues, whatever through whatever, and then you jump to new Avengers issues, whatever through whatever, which is what you did up to this point. Instead, you start alternating Avengers, new Avengers, Avengers, new Avengers. So it makes it really, really easy to follow. But the whole idea is that all these plots start coming to a head. So there's a moment where like Name of the Submariner, for example, goes to meet with Dr. Doom. And here's the cool thing. Dr. Doom, we haven't talked about yet, but Dr. Doom had been a background part of this story the entire time. Because one of the things that ends up happening is that there are multiple incursions that take place on Earth over the course of this story. I want to say there's something like four or five that the Illuminati are able to successfully stop. Dr. Doom becomes aware of one of these incursions. And in the process, he starts trying to understand how the incursions work, even going so far as to map the entirety of the multiverse. But what had also happened over the course of this is that there was a falling out between Name of the Submariner and the Illuminati, where like Black Panther killed or at least tried to kill Name of the Submariner because of Namor's actions in attacking Wakanda in the first place during Avengers vs. X-Men. And so where Namor is left for dead, what he ends up doing is coming across the newly freed Thanos and his Black Order, and he allies himself with them. The problem here is that Namor's perspective is that where the Illuminati are now backing off the idea of destroying all these alternate worlds, that Namor the Submariner sees it as the only way to win. He's like the last man standing and doing whatever needs to be done. But allying himself with Thanos and his Black Order, things go exactly the way that you would expect. Instead of Thanos and his Order just kind of destroying the world quickly, that in fact, Thanos and his Black Order are taking their time. They're relishing in all the murder and massacre that they're engaging in. And so it's really, really dark. And so ultimately, Name of the Submariner abandons the Black Order of Thanos. And then he goes to Dr. Doom and you get this amazing moment, right? Where Dr. Doom as the leader of Latveria, some might even argue he's a king, is having dinner with Namor. And Namor basically explains everything that had transpired up to this point. What the Illuminati were originally doing, how he felt like the Illuminati just weren't willing to do what needed to be done. So he allied himself with Thanos. Thanos was far more sadistic than Namor expected. And so Namor asked Dr. Doom for his help. And Doom's just like, no, I'm not gonna do that. And it's so cool the way it happened. Because Dr. Doom says, you could have come to me first. You should have come to me first, but you did not. I can forgive your initial dalliances with Richards and the others. Their nature is not conducive to such practicality. But after that, you chose to throw in with your subhuman lot. Now you regret it. And you drag the stinking carcass of your failure to my door. And so where Namor responds and saying, everything will stand or fall on what we face. Like literally we're facing the collapse of the multiverse, the response of Dr. Doom, you should have thought of that Namor and more carefully considered your position. You should have known better. Doom is no man's second choice. Literally, Doom is pissed at Namor because Namor didn't come to him first. It's the most petty thing ever, but it's the most Dr. Doom thing ever. But here's the cool thing. During Time Runs Out, Dr. Doom becomes the single most important person in the entirety of the collapse of the multiverse. And we'll talk about why here in a second. But the other great thing about time runs out is that you get answers for everything that's going on, why the incursions are happening and all that kind of cool stuff. And the answers actually come in two forms. The first answer comes by way of the Illuminati themselves. And the second answer comes from Dr. Doom. And so what ends up happening as part of time runs out is that all grudges are put to the side. Captain America and his forces, the Illuminati, the whole nine yards. They are all now a singular unified force in trying to find a way to stop the incursions. What Reed Rich Richards of the Fantastic Four reveals is that even using his son, Franklin Richards, who can alter reality on a universal scale, Franklin couldn't do anything to stop the incursions. And so early on, when the incursions were first learned about from the Illuminati, that Reed Richards and the Illuminati themselves sent Hank Pym and 
Ant-Man into the multiverse to try to find what was causing the incursions. Because all they knew was that this seemed to be caused by some mysterious guy out there named Raboom Alal. And that was it. That was all we knew about it. And so what ends up happening is Hank Pym comes back and he's like, I didn't find Raboom Alal. What I found was much, much worse. And Hank Pym's tale is incredible incredibly fascinating because what he says is when he initially went out into the multiverse that there was no true north right there were no arrows pointing like that way so he had to kind of gain his bearings and then he started jumping through realities and these realities were wide and varying but once he figures out his location he ends up coming across this kind of ragtag refugee fleet composed of builders that the builder war that we had read about in avengers was just one part of what was actually happening this builder war was taking place across the multiverse at the same time that the builders were eradicating earths everywhere because the idea was by destroying an earth you can save the universe and so even if one earth has to die however many billions of people on it it's saving countless trillions countless unknown numbers right it's the most efficient thing to do and so with this fleet having just been absolutely obliterated that the builders themselves were hunting the ivory kings eventually they pick up on this sort of beacon out there in the multiverse in one particular universe that seems to indicate the location of the Ivory Kings. When they get there, the Ivory Kings ambush them. Really, it's more like the henchmen of the Ivory Kings. But the builders are eradicated in one fell swoop, like that. Where the Avengers and everybody was struggling against them, they're obliterated instantly. Like the way that Hank Pym describes it, it's a massacre on multiversal proportions. Because after that, Hank Pym looks around and what he realizes is he's basically stumbled onto the battle field of a much grander war. The Beyonders, who are the Ivory Kings that everybody was talking about, they're annihilating and eradicating every cosmic entity across the multiverse at the same time. Infinity, Eternity, the Celestials, Galactus, it doesn't matter. They're all being destroyed. And there's like three Beyonders doing it, right? So once all these cosmic entities are eradicated, the Living Tribunal shows up, right? The multiverse given form. The second most powerful person, as far as the official hierarchy goes under the one above all. These three Beyonders annihilate the Living Tribunal. They kill it, right? Which is kind of cool because that explains why it is that earlier on in the Avengers and New Avengers run, you found the body of the Living Tribunal on the moon. Who killed it? How did it get there? And so what's really awesome is Hank Pym is like telling this to everybody, right? The Illuminati and Captain America and the Avengers and the whole nine yards. And he's like, there's no way that we can win. There's no way that we can pull this off. And so what this does is it leads into what's called the Multiversal Avengers. Because while all that's going on, a field team of Avengers, including Thor, Hyperion, and those guys are sent out into the multiverse to try to find the cause of the incursions as well. What ends up happening is Thor and his multiversal team end up in a universe that's actually a dimensional gateway. It's how the Beyonders are getting into the main Marvel universe. And it's just an absolute massacre. So much so that everybody except for Thor and Hyperion are killed. And so what ends up happening is Thor and Hyperion in this last moment have like this reconciliation, right? Where they're just like talking as brothers in arms. And it's amazing because they both realize they're going to die there. There's no way they make it out of that alive. And so Hyperion is just like, will you wait for me in Valhalla? Is what he asked Thor. And Thor is like, brother, today I will race you there. And the two of them just race headlong into their own oblivion. They go out like heroes. It's the greatest moment in the entirety of the story. It's so so phenomenal how it's done. But in effect, it's basically just showing there's no way for the superheroes to win against the odds that they're facing. But the question that the audience that we are kind of left with is, but how, right? Like what's going on with all of this? And so that comes by way of Dr. Doom. That what you end up learning here is that there's the Molecule Man, Owen Reese, and that Dr. Doom himself has known about the incursions the entire time. That the Molecule Man is this astronomically powerful guy. That he's basically a guy that is supposed to be able to control matter on the molecular level, but he controls atoms and he can do it on a multiversal level. But his origin story is identical across the multiverse because he was created by the Beyonders. The idea is that the Beyonders dropped a molecule man in every single universe and the goal was to blow them all up at the same time, which would blow up the multiverse. And so long before the Illuminati or any of these guys knew about the incursions, Dr. Doom had found out about it. And so what Dr. Doom and the molecule man had done is they had gone into an alternate reality and killed that Molecule Man with the idea being that if they kill enough Molecule Men, 
when the Beyonders execute their experiment, right? They press the button, they blow all the molecule men up. It won't destroy the entirety of the multiverse. It'll destroy however many universes still have molecule men in them. And so when the molecule man in that alternate reality is destroyed, it blows the universe up. The unintended side effect is it pushed the universes next to it into the universes next to them, which pushed those universes into the universes next to them. And so ultimately Dr. Doom and Molecule Man unintentionally caused the incursions. So the incursions are just a byproduct of Dr. Doom trying to save the entirety of the multiverse. Not only that, the Black Priests are basically like an immune system for the multiverse. It's the multiverse fighting back against its own destruction. No different than like antibodies in your body, right? White blood cells. And so once all this comes to a head, you learn that like Black Swan is part of a larger group called Black Swans and that Dr. Doom himself is Raboom Alal, that he had formed this army across the multiverse that was designed to one part destroy alternate Earths in order to save the multiverse, but at the same time, kill molecule men every way they could find them in order to save the multiverse. But it all comes to a head when Dr. Doom realizes there's no way to stave off the efforts of the Beyonders because now they're entering into the Marvel multiverse because they realize someone's killing molecule men and they've come to investigate and find out what's going on. And so Dr. Doom basically ends up bringing together all these molecule men across the multiverse alongside Doctor Strange, who's basically joined them at that point in time. And there comes a point when they go to the same universe where Thor and Hyperion died. And they literally have this just gigantic space box. It's literally a giant space box full of molecule men. So when the Beyonders invade, that Doctor Doom and Doctor Strange open up this box and all these molecule men race to the Beyonders and blow the Beyonders up. But the problem is that because such a massive amount of energy was released at one time, it basically blows up the entirety of the multiverse except for two universes. The Ultimate Universe, which is what the MCU is based on, and the main Marvel Universe. And so what Doctor Doom does is using the Molecule Man, he steals the power of those Beyonders because that power is just sitting out there in space after the destruction. He steals those powers and he ends up grabbing little bits and pieces of what's left of the multiverse and forms this hodgepodge planet called Battle World. And that's where Secret Wars 2015 picks up. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end, right? I guess that probably bears its own thing. We do have a whole playlist for this, so you guys are welcome to check it out. But let me know if you guys want me to like do this kind of video for Secret Wars. And let me know any other stories you want me to do this for as well, right? Because it's really, really cool stuff. But anyway, we're going to bring this to an end. Hopefully it wasn't too complicated and I will catch you all later. <laughs> Peace.